and uh, lately last 2 3 months lot of uh, you know news has been coming out on wifi 7 and so i thought uh, you know it's a good idea to give a talk on wifi and i also wanted to know more about wifi so with that uh, intent i started reading up about wifi what are the latest developments what the standard is all about and uh, today's talk is a result of that so before moving on i'll share my screen and then when and then we'll get into the details of wifi so can everyone see my screen yes yes we can see your screen so as is common in my talks i typically publish the content on devopedia and then the talk is based around the published content so we'll cover some of the techniques uh, or some of the changes that wifi 7 has introduced and compare it to what wifi 6 was providing and uh, there are a couple of uh, new features introduced in wifi 7 so we'll uh, you know uh, i'll give a brief explanation of what those features are then we'll look at the state of the market uh, so if uh, the, you have questions you can ask uh, when i give pass or towards the end of the session session so initially i'll cover at a high level uh, when you ask questions maybe i can uh, go deeper into a specific topic okay so let's start with an overview of wifi 7 so uh, some of the things uh, obviously the two things are both the physical layer as well as mac layer both are modified so we'll cover both of those changes so let's talk about uh, you know some of the physical layer changes so in uh, uh, actually in wifi 6 itself uh, uh, in they had a kind of a revision which they called it uh, 6e so the difference between wifi 6 and 6e is that 6e allows uh, operation in 6 gigahertz band so some of you who are actively working in wifi you will know this so uh, but even in 6 gigahertz band i think in wifi 6e the maximum channel bandwidth that was possible is 160 megahertz so that is expanded in wifi 7 to 320 megahertz so the channel bandwidth is double so obviously this immediately gives a benefit of 2x higher throughput so that is the first thing we have to note then the second thing at the physical layer is uh, the modulation so the modulation at best in uh, wifi 6 was uh, 1k qom that is 1024 uh, qom and that is to say uh, the number of constellation points were uh, 1024 now that is uh, quadrupled that means from 1024 it has now become 4096 4k qom and this gives a increase in transmission rate by 20% so now you may ask those of you who are not in telecom you know i increased it from uh, 1k to 4k four times i have increased the constellation why my transmission rate has gone up only by 20% so what is the answer for that because of log because of log okay yeah kind of correct yes any better answer yeah your answer is correct yes maybe a little bit more explanation so the explanation is uh, in 1024 qom as i said there are maybe we'll take a uh, figure for that 1024 qom okay so this is our constellation there are let's say uh, 1024 points on this constellation and uh, now what it means is that every symbol uh, sorry every 10 this is basically digital modulation so 10 bits of data you take those 10 bits and you represent that data as one particular point in this constellation that means every point on this constellation represents 10 bits of data now if you do the same thing with 4096 that means now you add many more points in this constellation uh, four times 4096 then how many bits are we representing we are now representing 12 bits so you take 12 bits of data and translate that into one constellation point on the 4096 qom 
So now 10 bits becomes uh, 12 bits. So that is the 20% increase in the transmission. So now every symbol is able, you are able to transmit 20% uh, uh, more. So that is where the 20% figure comes from. Then uh, another important uh, thing is multiple RUs. So in Wi-Fi 6, they introduced the concept of OFDMA, which was not there earlier in earlier Wi-Fi standards. Uh, but in or so along with OFDMA, they introduced the concept of resource unit. So every uh, client can be allocated resources in terms of resource units and different resource units are defined in the standards. Some are small units, some are larger units, depending on the bandwidth. I mean, data rate requirements uh, for each client. So the access point can uh, assign different uh, sized RUs to different clients. Now the thing in Wi-Fi 6 was uh, every station or every client can be can be allocated only one RU at a time. So that was uh, the starting point. Uh, now in Wi-Fi 7, uh, a station can be allocated multiple RUs. And these RUs uh, need not be contiguous. They can be in different places in the spectrum. So this is one of the uh, important changes introduced in Wi-Fi 7. This gives a very uh, lot of flexibility in, for the access point in terms of scheduling. And it can work around interferers. Suppose at certain RUs, there is an interference. Access point can act, ignore that particular RU and give uh, allocation uh, of a uh, different RU, which may not be contiguous. So in terms of scheduling there, it brings a lot of flexibility. And it also increases, enhances spectral efficiency. You can, there is no wastage of spectrum. So I will, uh, uh, there is another figure to explain this. So I will explain this uh, in detail later. Now in terms of uh, Mac layer also, there are uh, multiple changes. One of the changes is something called multi-link operation. So typically in Wi-Fi 6, uh, the only uh, is station is uh, like we, it can operate in only one band. So there are three bands, 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz. And uh, like even when we connect to a Wi-Fi router at home from our mobile or from our uh, laptop, we typically need to select because at least in my home, I have a router. There are two SSIDs, one for 5 gigahertz and one for 2.4 gigahertz. So when I associate my laptop to the access point, I have to select one of these. And for the rest of the session, you know, my laptop will be communicating with the access point only on that selected band. Right. So it, the operation was a single link operation. Now that is uh, uh, enhanced in Wi-Fi 7. Now Wi-Fi 7 supports multi-link operation, which means that client and an access point can be talking to each other in three different bands, you know, uh, 2.4, 5, as well as in 6 gigahertz. And within each of these links, you can be having multiple RU allocations. So again, you know, the kind of uh, thing uh, Wi-Fi 7 brings uh, in terms of flexibility is, is Quite, it, this is quite a big deal uh, when you compare it to Wi-Fi 6. Okay, uh, then there are a few more things. Uh, 512 compressed block ACK. Uh, okay, so the thing is in Mac layer, a feature was introduced, uh, I think in one of the earlier standards. So I have explained this here. So in one of the earlier standards, uh, they introduced something called uh, block acknowledgement feature. So what happens in block ACK is that, uh, see every time you transmit a Mac PDU, uh, the receiver need not acknowledge the Mac PDU immediately. In fact, the receiver can bundle the acknowledgements for many PDUs and send it as a single ACK. So that feature is called the block ACK. And in Wi-Fi 6, the limit was 256 Mac PDUs. That means with a single bitmap, the receiver can acknowledge up to 256 MAC PDUs. So now this is increased. This number is increased to 512 in Wi-Fi 7. So this is again one of the changes introduced by Wi-Fi 7. Now, obviously what this does, this brings a efficiency improvement. 
because now you don't have to send so many acts and it makes sense now because wi-fi 7 the transmission rates are much higher we have introduced uh, 4k qualm and then channel bandwidth has also in, uh, increased so now your transmitter is going to be sending at a higher data rate so some so we needed an increased efficiency in, in terms of managing the acknowledgements so this is one of the things uh, that has been increased in the mac layer from 256 to 512 then there is another feature called aggregated mac pdu where multiple mac pdus this is on the transmitter side multiple let's say the buffer is buffer is having a lot of data to be sent and multiple mac pdus can be aggregated and sent together so what this means it means that multiple mac pdus will share the same physical uh, pdu uh, so the frame is going to be the same so this number is also increased to uh, 1024 in Wi-Fi 7. I don't know what was the number in uh, Wi-Fi 6, probably half of this, but in Wi-Fi 7, this has been increased to 1024. So these are some of the changes at the Mac layer. In terms of QoS, I talked about QoS a little bit earlier. So QoS is a very essential uh, you know, feature or people have been focusing a lot on QoS in the Wi-Fi space, mainly because uh, there is, of course, who is the competition for Wi-Fi? It's cellular. So many of the things which cellular introduce, those technical concepts or approaches are also coming to Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi 6 introduced to OFDMA that was already there in uh, 5G. Uh, and then this uh, idea of uh, some of these ideas of block acknowledgements, you know, some of these things were already there in uh, 5G. So QoS is again one of those things, uh, you know, which Wi-Fi is trying to address. So uh, all of us know how 5G works. 5G mainly works uh, based on uh, very, uh, what do you call scheduling. It's a scheduling driven approach. It is not random access. So most of it is scheduling uh, driven by the base station. So similarly in Wi-Fi, there is an increasing uh, push towards moving as many things as possible from a random access uh, kind of mechanism towards a more scheduled mechanism. So in that spirit, you know, uh, some of the things that were introduced was target wake time. So this was already introduced in an earlier standard uh, and similarly uh, stream classification service in which you can classify certain uh, streams as higher priority streams. So now, you know, when uh, transmission is required, these streams will get high. Typically, this will be voice and video kind of applications. So they will have a higher priority. So these features are enhanced in Wi-Fi 7. So in Wi-Fi 7, they have introduced something called restricted target wake time. So what happens in RTWT uh, devices who are transmitting on the channel, whenever a TWT service period is about to start, immediately they have to cease their transmissions and then all those stations or clients who are now part of this rtwt they will listen and they will assess whether they have a chance to transmit or they need to uh, listen to some incoming data so that is the concept of rtwt we can't go into too much detail uh, at this uh, in today's session but this is uh, what it is Similarly, in the stream classification service, a new element has been added called QoS characteristics. So this, uh, you know, includes a lot of data uh, through uh, by which, you know, both uh, access point and uh, uh, clients can prioritize their traffic. And this helps the access point in uh, uh, allocating resources to the clients. So obviously, based on this, it will give a priority to uh, uh, latency sensitive applications like video streaming or voice streaming. So these are the QoS related changes. Uh, we talked about random access and allocation. So uh, yeah, so this is uh, what uh, like trigger frame was introduced in uh, Wi-Fi 6 along with OFDMA. So that that is of course uh, continued in uh, Wi-Fi 7, but it makes certain improvements to that. 
OK, so these are the main changes. Uh, now let's uh, go into some of the details of uh, a couple of features which are important. So one of the features which I talked about is uh, multiple RUs. So this is an example of multiple RU. So let's assume that uh, this is 320 megahertz. OK, and it so happens that in this 320 megahertz, a particular station requires uh, has a lot of data, so it requires it has a higher uh, data rate uh, requirement at the moment. Unfortunately, in this there is a 20 megahertz of uh, let's say interference. Now in current or in uh, Wi-Fi 6, uh, because of this 20 megahertz interference, this part of the spectrum cannot be allocated. So what the access point will do, it will only allocate this 160 megahertz to the client. Now here, the rest of it, which is what 140, let's assume this is right at the center. The remaining 140 megahertz is wasted. It cannot be allocated to this particular station. But of course, the access point, even in Wi-Fi 6, it can allocate this 140 megahertz to another station, but it can't allocate 140 because that is not a valid combination in Wi-Fi 6. So at best, what it can do, it can allocate uh, 80 megahertz. So again, you don't, you are not fully utilizing the spectrum. So one station is allocated 160, another station is allocated 80, then 20 is uh, not usable because of interference. Then you still have 60 megahertz, which cannot be allocated uh, to either of these two stations. But then if you have three more stations, each requiring 20 megahertz, then you can allocate those three as well. So you see, uh, it all depends on uh, how how much uh, traffic, I mean, how many stations are there in the network and what are their current requirements. But for argument's sake, let's say there is only one station and it has a very high bandwidth requirement. And in this particular situation in Wi-Fi 6, you can use only 160 megahertz and a lot of the remaining spectrum is wasted just because of this interferer. Now this can be easily solved in Wi-Fi 7 because now it allows multiple resource units. So you can allocate 160 megahertz here, you can allocate 80 megahertz here, and then you can allocate another you know, 40 megahertz, 20 megahertz. Uh, so that flexibility is there. So multiple RUs can be allocated to the uh, same station. Another way of looking at it, uh, which you will all, all often find in Qualcomm slides, because when, whenever I looked at Qualcomm documents, they never use the term multiple RUs. So this is a term used in the standard in, and in many other sources. But if you look at some of the Qualcomm's uh, white papers or marketing material, they always use the term preamble puncturing. So this is also uh, equivalent concept. Basically, what it means is that where the interference is currently occurring, let's say this 20 megahertz, you can puncture the preamble. Basically, you don't transmit at this point. So this is uh, maybe an implementation specific thing. I am not sure, but another this is equivalent to the multiple RU concept, which we just talked about. Now, of course, you know, in Wi-Fi, there, there are so many bandwidths from ranging from 20, 40, right up to now 320 megahertz. So there are so many different combinations in which RUs can be combined towards a particular station. So this actually makes scheduling, of course, it uh, gives the access point a lot of flexibility, but it also increases the overhead in terms of signaling because you have to now signal one out of you know dozens of combinations towards the station. Right, so signaling becomes complex, and because of that, that overhead can affect the overall spectral efficiency. So what the standardized standardization has done is, instead of allowing all possible combinations, they have defined exactly what combinations are allowed. Only a subset of combinations are allowed, and this is what is allowed in Wi-Fi 7. So there are two types of RUs, small size RUs, which are these stones, 26, 52, 106. So what are these numbers for those not, uh, I mean, those not in telecom? Each tone, tone basically means subcarriers. 
So uh, as you know, in OFDM, we have subcarriers making up the spectrum. So 26 tone means uh, this RU has 26 subcarriers. 52 tone means 52 subcarriers. Now a point to note is that not all 52 subcarriers contain data. Only 48 subcarriers uh, take data. The other four subcarriers are used for pilot. Right, so this is uh, something we have to keep in mind. When you calculate the you know peak data rates, you can't simply multiply by 52 because only 48 of them carry data. So likewise, in each of these RUs, some are al uh, allocated for uh, pilot, and then some are allocated for what you call data. So in this 996 tone RU, which is the biggest RU, 980 are data and the remaining 16 uh, carry pilot signals. OK, so point to note here is that in these allowed combinations, only small sized RUs can be combined with the small sized RUs. You can't combine a small size RU with a large size RU. That is not a valid combination. So if we go back to our example where we had 320 megahertz and then there was an interferer in between 20 megahertz. So in that particular example, what would have happened? 160 megahertz would be combined with 80 megahertz. And then the station will be allocated 240 megahertz of RU uh, of a spectrum uh, composed of two RUs. But it can, uh, the, the same station cannot be assigned uh, 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz. Right, because uh, there the RUs are small sized RUs. So the point to note is that small size RUs cannot be combined with large size RUs. So you may say, you know, in some uh, situations like in our example, it's not the best use of spectrum. But you see, when you are defining standards, we have to draw a line. Uh, you know, you have to trade off uh, spectrum because spectrum efficiency comes from the uh, not just how you make the combinations, but also in the minimizing the signaling. The more combinations you have, uh, the greater is the signaling overhead as well. So considering all this, you know, these are the you know allowed combinations which have been defined. And uh, fewer combinations may also translate to, you know, easier implementation. Another thing to keep in mind now, testing of Wi-Fi 7 uh, becomes much uh, more uh, uh, difficult or troublesome, you can say, because now suddenly you have many more combinations to test, right? So certification of Wi-Fi 7 products is also going to be more involved because of all these different combinations now that need to be tested. OK, so uh, so I'll give an example. This is an example uh, which comes from uh, Samsung. It's not Samsung, it comes from Qualcomm, I think. Yes, Qualcomm. So Qualcomm has a chipset which uh, is capable of something like this. So you can have. OK, this is not call, uh, Qualcomm specific. This is a general uh, point to note. So this is the maximum uh, assignment that you can make uh, towards a particular uh, station when you talk about multiple RUs. So this occurs in the 6 gigahertz band where you can agree in aggregate assign three 996 tone RUs and one 484 tone RU. So this is the maximum allocation that you can have uh, in a particular uh, in the six gigahertz band. OK, so this is the one of the main changes introduced by Wi-Fi 7. The other main change happens in the Mac layer, which is what we are going to talk about. So already I mentioned uh, in the beginning that now uh, Wi-Fi 7 has introduced something called a multiple link operation, where a station and an access point can be talking to each other across multiple links. So you can see in this example, all, all three uh, bands are active, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz. So three links are there, and then uh, you know data can be transferred across all three links. And there are various uh, different capabilities uh, depending on the cost form factor, uh, you know, the implementation complexity. Different uh, categories of uh, clients are out there. Uh, but basically, the common term that is used is called MLD, 
which you will find often in literature. Uh, so multi-link device. So it can be, it, it is a term which is applicable for client as well as for access point. And the general architecture of MLD is like this. Our uh, MAC layer, which was typically simply known as MAC in Wi-Fi 6 standard, that is now split into two parts, upper MAC and lower MAC. Now, uh, some of you who are actively working in Wi-Fi, you may recognize these terms because from the implementation perspective, we have always been using these terms. But now these terms are used in the standard as well uh, from Wi-Fi 7. But this is specific to uh, MLD uh, type of uh, architecture. So, uh, uh, so in this case, so for every link, you know, Mac layer does channel access, back off, and so on, right? So that is the job of the lower Mac. Then upper Mac takes care of things which are common to the device, which need not be executed in every layer in every link. So, for example, encryption and decryption or uh, what do you call association of a client with the access point. So see, these are some of the things which will happen in the upper Mac. So the functionality is clearly split or defined in the standard between upper Mac and lower Mac. So this is the concept of uh, multi-link operation. Now there are different uh, modes of uh, multi-link operation. So this is a slide from Intel. <coughs> which gives a very uh, simplistic view uh, of, uh, but this is an easy slide to understand. So you have an access point and a device and both are operating, uh, I mean, both are capable of multi-link operation. So on the left side, we have something known as a multi-link single radio. That means although, you know, the device and the access point can use either of the two bands. Let's say one of them is 2.4 gigahertz, other one is 5 gigahertz, right? So either of them can be used, but at any one point, only one of them will be used. Only one link will be active. So you can see here, this is the time axis. So at this time, you know, either the access point or the device is sending data on channel one. Then in the next uh, time period, the packet is sent on channel two. So at every uh, point in time, a decision is made, which channel is better, which channel has lower interference or better channel characteristics. Or maybe the channel is, maybe at this point, channel one is busy. That means some other station is transmitting. So channel two is free. So then access point and device will start communicating in channel two. So now this is an example of a multi-link single radio communication then there is another reason why you know device and access point can be communicating in this manner it is because the device is a low end device it doesn't have two independent radios in its implementation a single radio is shared for two bands so it can it cannot transmit on both the bands at the same time so now you may ask why would anybody design a wi-fi 7 uh, module with this kind of a capability uh, the main reason could be uh, cost. Another reason could be form factor. So yeah, uh, and maybe time to market. So they want to quickly uh, put out their uh, solution in the market. So the Wi-Fi 7 device is capable of other things. For example, it can support 4K QAM. It can support uh, 320 megahertz, but it is single radio. It cannot support both radios. So there are different reasons why uh, you know people would put out a chipset or a module with this kind of capability. So that is a multi-link single radio. Then enhanced multi-link, it has certain nuances. We'll not go into that, but uh, I have uh, given those details in the article. The other important thing is uh, multi-link multi-radio. So this is a kind of a high-end device. And this is where you know implementation will try to uh, move towards. So in this particular uh, device, you can see here, both the access point and the device are sending or receiving on both the channels simultaneously. So now what happens on aggregate? Now the you know uh, bandwidth or the data rate that can be pushed uh, between these two. Uh, is now much higher 
So maybe in channel one earlier, you could send only 10 uh, Gbps, let's assume for argument's sake. You know, well, uh, let's not say 10 Gbps. Let's say in Wi-Fi 6, the maximum bitrate was 9.6 Gbps. So let's take a realistic scenario. Maybe only one Gbps previously it was possible on channel one. Let's say 5 gigahertz. Now in Wi-Fi 7, you can use the 5 gigahertz channel 1 plus 6 gigahertz channel 1, channel 2, and each of them in each of them you can pump 1 Gbps. So now your aggregate throughput is higher. So now this is the beauty of multi-link operation. And not only that, it gives you uh, uh, so it also meets one of the important goals of Wi-Fi 7. See, one of the goals of Wi-Fi 7 is reliable or stable communication between access point and device. So in Wi-Fi 6, for example, suppose channel 1, channel 2 doesn't exist because they are communicating in only one channel. Suddenly there is a, some interference on channel 1. What will happen? Suddenly throughput will drop, delay will increase, and then uh, you know packets will get buffered. In real-time communication, some packets may get dropped. So all sorts of problems arise when you have only one channel. Now in Wi-Fi uh, wi 7, you have two channels. You may also communicate on the third channel. If there is an interference, let's say on channel one, you are still active on channel two and three. So this brings greater reliability uh, in terms of uh, the communication links. So this has been one of, one of the important uh, goals of Wi-Fi 7 greater reliability along with higher throughput and uh, uh, reduction of delays. OK, so. Now I will pause any questions at this point. Before I move on to the next part. OK, I, no question. Uh, yeah, I have one ahead. worry actually. So yeah. in the ML node case, right? You have seen that there is a upper Mac and lower Mac. Yeah. Uh, so, but how the random backup will among will happen on all the three bands actually? Uh, yeah. So see each. Uh, so there there are certain things here which I did not cover. Uh, since you asked, I will cover those here. See if you look at different types of MLO. I have given here multi-link single radio enhanced ML uh, SR, then multi-link multi-radio enhanced ML uh, MR. But another way of grouping them is in terms of these two parameters. MLO can be asynchronous or it can be synchronous. Now your question, the answer is here. In the case of synchronous MLO, uh, the access point and uh, device will coordinate the transmission so that the start and end of transmission are synchronized across all the three bands, which means that backup will happen only on the primary link. So you have three links. Assume one of them is primary 2.4 gigahertz. So backup will happen only on, on 2.4 gigahertz. And when it gains access to the channel, it is, uh, I mean, depending on the design, it is implicit that it has also gained access to the other two channels. So the transmission will be synchronous. The more flexible thing uh, is the asynchronous transmission, where transmission need not be synchronous across all the three bands. But this comes at the expense of complexity in terms of uh, managing the outer band emissions, interference cancellation techniques, plus each link will have its own backup. Because uh, yeah, this, uh, trans transmissions are not synchronized. Depending on when the channel becomes available on that band, you, you can uh, you know, uh, remove your back off and start gaining access to the channel. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, in Any the, other and questions? One, yeah. yeah. Uh, and one more thing is like in the single radio case, right? Uh, two cross two. So you, you might. So how the link uh, will move from one to the other actually? So for us, for suppose first it uh, established connection in two point four, and then. Yeah. How it will switch actually? Is it first established uh, this link in both the links or one after the other kind of thing? Yeah, I don't have uh, like uh, exact answer. I am assuming mm -hmm. uh, from my reading it will be one after another. 
So once transmission is completed, let's say on 2.4, immediately it's not going to transmit on uh, 5. It will uh, wait for an allocation on 5. That is, it is before that either access point uh, or uh, like access point or a client will determine which band has to be used depending on the occupancy of the band or presence of interference. Once the band is selected, then you know the back off will start and access to the channel will be taken. Oh, thank okay. you. But when you are having OFDMA in place, you need not do back off all the time uh, and uh, go for random access or contention because you will be watching the trigger frame and then you will be sending your buffer status report. So based on that, you will get allocation. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, the thing is when a stake connects to an AP, right? There's already a, a negotiation which happens, which are the channels which we can use. And uh, typically, if there'll be, a, in case of MLSR, whatever, the single radio case, so there'll be an active channel and there'll be a passive channel. So if if the, and the thing is, typically the AP is like a STR device which can listen on both the channels to what, whatever are the number of active channels. So that is how it it is it happens. Yeah, from AP perspective, it is fine. But uh, AP correct. has multiple uh, bands, right? They are independent. But station, right? There is only single radio correct. actually. Correct. So the station first will indicate to the AP that which is the active channel which it is using and which is the passive. Okay. Now how the switching so, will happen from active to passive and all those things? Uh, so in case the stay sees that the active channel is very congested, then it will switch over to the next channel. Yeah, that too, it but is station is uh, dependent only, right? It's not AP. Correct. AP won't force, right? No, AP can force. For example, if AP has to send some critical information in the other channel, for example, say we have 2G and 5G channel connected, and uh, say in one of the beacons, AP has to send only in the 5G channel, so it will indicate in the 2G beacon that the next beacon coming in 5G channel is very important. So by the expectation is they will immediately switch over to that channel and listen to that beacon. Thank you. Oh, okay, thanks uh, Sudhir for that clarification. Maybe you can just uh, introduce yourself where you're working. Yeah. Uh, I currently work in uh, Infinium uh, and uh, I work in the double and file layer. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Okay, any further questions? Okay, now uh, if you look at some of the marketing material out there, a lot of people will use the term quad band. There are only three bands in uh, Wi Fi, right? 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz. So, what is the meaning of quad band? you will hear this term very often, right, quad band. So what they really mean is that uh, the, that particular AP is capable of four links. That's what they actually mean. So here is an example which is coming from uh, a Qualcomm uh, product description. So they claim that their chipset is quad band. What they mean is that this is what they mean. You can have, you can aggregate 320 megahertz, two of these, and then one of 240 megahertz at 5 gigahertz, one of 40 megahertz at 2.4. So now at 6 gigahertz band, they are using two 320 megahertz band, channel bandwidths. So in aggregate, they are calling this quad band. So when you see devices, uh, you know, with this kind of uh, claim, don't get confused. This is what they mean. Actually, multiple uh, allocations are there within one. Yeah, if multiple links are operating within the same band, that's what it means. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify this because first, when I first saw this term quad band, it was confusing to me. But in industry, this is how this term is being used. Okay, and uh, if you look at the channels, those who are working in Wi-Fi 6, you will already know this. So, at, you know, 20 megahertz, 59 of those, and then 
you can aggregate all these. Now in uh, six gigahertz, this slide is only about the six gigahertz band. So in six gigahertz band, you can have three 320 megahertz. And if you want to give more finer allocation, right? Because you have a lot of stations associated with you, a uh, lot of devices are connected. Then you may start allocating lower bandwidths for each device, 80 megahertz, 40 megahertz, depending on the requirement. Now you can see here in the 30, uh, three to, and, uh, three, 320 megahertz allocation, it is not uniform. Some are allocated like there are two options given. In the first option, in both cases, you have three uh, you know, possibilities, but here it starts at five, uh, 5945 megahertz. Here it starts much later. So the point here is that the six gigahertz band is not uh, globally uh, approved. So this is one of the uh, problems that Wi-Fi has been dealing with for some time. And uh, interestingly, in 2020, uh, in the US FCC, which is the uh, like authority uh, managing the spectrum allocation. So in 2020, April 2020, FCC announced that the six gigahertz band is now available for unlicensed operations. So this was a big deal. It was a big announcement. And it was also the time, you know, when Wi-Fi 7 was being standardized and Wi-Fi 6E, which included uh, 6 gigahertz operation, those products were uh, coming out in the market. So given those circumstances, FCC announced that uh, at least in the, of course, in the US, they will be opening up the 6 gigahertz band for unlicensed operations. And then, uh, you know, uh, in October last year, FCC announced that uh, only very low power devices will be allowed to operate in 6 gigahertz band. Which means that, uh, you know, there, there is some uh, constraint here. So we have two bands, UNNI 5 and UNNI 7, both are in the 6 gigahertz band. Uh, people, uh, you may have seen the term, uh, lower band and higher band. So cumulatively, they give about 850 megahertz of spectrum. So this is a big deal because such huge spectrum is a boost for Wi-Fi. But of course, here there is a limitation. You can transmit only at very low power. It can be indoor or outdoor, but you should not exceed the power limitations. Now what has happened recently, that is to say in February this year, just two to three months back, FCC has approved seven vendors or seven systems for automatic automated frequency coordination. That means, let's say you are deployed, you, you are deploying Wi-Fi seven in a particular location, and uh, it's going to be operating in the six gigahertz band. Now, using this system, you can declare to the system that I am using. Uh, six gigahertz band exactly these uh, you know uh, areas of the spectrum at this particular location so this system contains the location of the deployment as well now when any new system in that area comes up it has to query this database to figure out whether anyone else is using that spectrum in that nearby location and only if it is free they are allowed to use that spectrum in that area so with this AFC systems, which have been up, seven of these have been approved a few months back. With this system, that low power limitation has been removed. Now Wi-Fi 7 devices, even in 6 gigahertz, or for that matter, it can be Wi-Fi 6E devices as well. They are now allowed to transmit at standard power. Whether, uh, yeah, at standard power, I don't think it matters whether it's indoor or outdoor, they can do so. Only thing is, the client devices should be fixed, right? It cannot be for uh, you know highly mobile client devices, of uh, because this is very location sensitive. The transmission and reception should be within that location. But the limitation on power is removed. And why this AFC is needed? Because in this six gigahertz, there are other transmitters from other systems. Let's say microwaves may be there, and then radio astronomy also uses 
some of the spectrum in the 6 gigahertz uh, band. So those are like interferers and uh, Wi-Fi transmission should not interfere with those systems. So for that reason, you know, this AFC system has to be used before you start transmitting. And if for any reason you see interference from these guides, then that can be easily handled through preamble puncturing, which we talked about earlier, right? So all this is great, right? Uh, FCC has approved uh, unlicensed operation in 6 gigahertz band, but FCC is just a authority for the American airspace, right? It is not a global authority. So the global authority is this guy, WRC, I think World Radio Consortium or whatever. So in December last year at the WRC 23 meeting, a decision was taken that the 6 gigahertz spectrum, some parts of it or quite a large portion of it is set aside for licensed 5G operation. So now this is like a setback for Wi-Fi. Right, so now exactly how these two developments will uh, play going forward, we are not clear. But what is clear is that Wi-Fi, uh, when it is deployed globally, people have to follow the local regulations. So if Wi-Fi 7 devices are deployed in India, we have to follow the spectrum allocations which are local. Because mind it, uh, some of the spectrum is now globally assigned for 5G. Which means that, uh, you know, this spectrum may become, will be unavailable within India once, you know, this is ratified by the TRI uh, or whoever is the Indian authority. So these are some of the things, uh, you know, uh, Wi-Fi uh, is dealing with, and of course, everyone knows, you know, Wi-Fi and cellular have always been competitors. So that's about uh, uh, Wi-Fi 7. Uh, we covered most of the technical things. If you look at the standardization, any standard, it takes about five years. So only now, you know, Wi-Fi 7, uh, I didn't show you that particular thing. So, yeah, you see January this year, just a few months ago, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance announced that uh, Wi-Fi certific uh, certification process is now ready. So that means if you are a vendor who is coming out with uh, Wi-Fi 7 products, you can get them certified at a specific certification labs. So that process is now in place since January, which means that now is the time when more and more Wi-Fi 7 devices will be launched into the market. And, uh, you know, Qualcomm alone has announced 450 plus designs. That means a lot of product manufacturers are using the Qualcomm uh, chipset. So, yeah, and uh, of course there are so many other vendors so I have captured some of them here. Uh, Broadcom, Intel, Max Linear, MediaTek, Qualcomm, modules, a few of those. Uh, Samsung, of course, I didn't mention it. Then uh, devices, this is just tip of the iceberg. Like I told you, there are hundreds of them manufacturing Wi-Fi 7 products. Test equipment, of course, uh, some of these guys, 100 to NI, Rode and Schwartz, Pyrant. Keysight. Keysight also could be one of them, I think. Yeah. Now, what is the maximum uh, data rate uh, that uh, Wi-Fi 7 promises? So Wi-Fi 7 promises a data rate of 46 Gbps. So the peak data rate for Wi-Fi 6 or 6E uh, is 9.6 Gbps, right? And why, when Wi-Fi was standardized, the goal was to achieve uh, data rate of at least 30 Gbps. So the standardization has surpassed this and uh, it is now able to achieve 46 Gbps. So I have given a calculation. If you are interested, you can calculate how this is possible. So we already saw it is uh, 4K QAM, so 12 bits per symbol. And then you use uh, the modulation and ch uh, channel coding scheme. Uh, so that is a five by six. Then how many symbols can you push per second? So this is determined by the symbol period. 
So the symbol transmission time in Wi-Fi, this is same as Wi-Fi 6, no change here. It, it is 12.8 microseconds. Then there is a guard interval of 0 0.8 microseconds. There are other longer guard intervals. We are trying to calculate the peak rate, so we take the minimum. So if you take this equation, you will end up with the, this number, 73,529 symbols per second. Now out of this, so these symbols go on uh, what do you call the subcarriers. So now I said that there are data subcarriers and pilot subcarriers. So if we consider only subcarriers, data subcarriers at the 320 megahertz band, you will get 3920. And then uh, you do 16 cross 16. Uh, I think I didn't mention this. So in Wi-Fi 6, you can do at most 8 cross 8 streams. Now in uh, Wi-Fi 7, you can do 16 times 16. So remember, all this calculation is from the access point perspective. It is very rare to get a client which will be capable of 16 bar 16. So it's mostly access points which will be capable of pushing this kind of data rate. So this is coming to 46 Gbps. Now the thing is, so far as my research goes, there is not a single chipset out there which can achieve this. So the best I have seen is the Qualcomm Networking Pro 1620. So this claims to achieve 33 Gbps, at least theoretically, 33 Gbps uh, throughput. Uh, and this is what I have shown here earlier. I gave an example of quad band, if you recall here. Combining two 320s, one 240 and one 40 across three bands. This gives you a peak data rate of 33 Gbps. Okay. Now you may ask why didn't uh, is Qualcomm not able to deliver 46 Gbps? Well, the fact is that even 33 is very high because you may think that it may be possible, even if it's possible to achieve 46, uh, who will buy the chipset? So we have to consider the commercial angles as well. And having said that, you know, Broadcom, they launched two generations of Wi-Fi 7 chipset. And the second generation is of a lower uh, capability compared to the first generation, probably because they realize that, you know, they need to provide their chipsets at a lower price point. So their second generation chipsets are have a lower capability and they are cheaper than their first generation chipset. So we have to keep those things in mind as well. Now coming to, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, this figure gives you an idea. Uh, this is the Broadcom chipset first generation. And, uh, you know, when you are making chipsets, you have to think of the entire portfolio, right? Not just access point or not just client side of things. So for a client or a consumer, they, you know, came up with this chip 4398. So it, Probably it can go into a smartphone, 320 megahertz, physical rate 6 Gbps, and so on. Right? So mobile, smartphones, AR, VR devices. So they can be fitted with this. Then uh, two types of access points. Residential, which is at a lower price point, let's say. Then there is enterprise. So yeah, then the four by four streams, two by two streams, different bandwidths, different capabilities. So these are the kind of uh, yeah chipsets out there. And this is just one example of Broadcom. So like this, every vendor has a portfolio. Qualcomm has one, I'm sure uh, others have it as well. Okay, so what is left to cover? Uh, yeah, one final slide. What are the implementation challenges with uh, Wi-Fi 7? So you guys can guess, uh, you know, 4096 QAM is not trivial uh, you know, to implement because now your constellation is much tighter, right? Your modulation, demodulation has, has to be more accurate. Uh, power amplifiers must be, uh, the linearity must be maintained. Then the other issue with the uh, 4K QAM is that this will work only when the SNR is very high. 
so typically snr requirements uh, you know are in excess of 35 db right so that is the kind of uh, good signal strength that you need to realize uh, 4k qualm so what this means is that your device has to be probably line of sight and uh, pretty close to the access point so th those are the conditions and another thing which you know people have been talking about in the industry is that 4k is real realizable only if you use multiple streams so if you try to achieve 4k with just one cross one it's not going to work so you may need something like four cross four or two cross two to realize uh, you know 4k qualm so that's uh, something that we have to think about and the power must be because now we are operating on a wide band power must be distributed evenly across the entire bandwidth. So we have to think about that as well. And uh, for multi-link operation, now you are, uh, it's a challenge because now you have to manage multiple radios. And then even at Mac layer, you have to decide uh, like backoffs. Now you have to, on each link, you have to manage the backoffs. And scheduling, scheduling is also complex because now Within each link, you will you may be having multiple RUs as well. So the complexity in terms of scheduling, uh, both on the client side and much more on the access point side, the scheduling is complex. So different people implement this differently. Uh, so if you look at the MediaTek architecture, they have separate RF chips for each of the links. And this is Broadcom. I don't have a figure for the MediaTek. But for each, uh, let's say there are three links, there will be three RF chip. Uh, responsible for both the upper Mac and the lower Macs. So the Mac functionality is integrated into a common baseband chip. So that is how MediaTek does it. But if you look at the Broadcom architecture, it is different. So this is an example of uh, Broadcom architecture where you have three chips which uh, deal with the lower Mac. And the upper Mac is uh, managed in a separate chip and all the other kind of processing. Maybe scheduling across, you know, different uh, links, all those taken care of in this processor, which is a norm based processor. So this is how the Broadcom architecture is very different. Now, if you look at this overall block diagram, you can call this as a reference, uh, you know, application diagram. So you will need, you know, this chip and three of this for, you know, tri-band communication, let's say. Now, the important thing is, when we, you know, as why if we are working on Wi-Fi, especially if you are working on Pi layer, Mac layer, we don't look at the big picture. But if you are a company like Broadcom, which is tasked with uh, in releasing an entire portfolio of chips, it has to also consider how these chips will be used in the overall application. So now what most people forget is that, uh, okay, all this Wi-Fi stuff is great, but do you have enough capacity on the backhaul? So you are claiming Wi-Fi 7 can achieve 46 Gbps, but is, is your WAN and LAN connection capable of 46 Gbps? That is the question to be asked. So now if you look at this overall architecture, you can see here uh, the LAN capability has been increased, I believe, from previous generation. So you have 2.5, 2.5, then uh, 4 gigabit LAN, 4 cross something, and then 10 gig. But the WAN connection is, uh, you know, maxing out at 10 gig, right? So this sets the limit on how much the entire system can achieve. That means if you are trying to download, let's say, let's say there are 10 clients, each client is trying to download a 8K video from the internet. Now, in aggregate, this will uh, probably, you know, exceed 30 Gbps but you cannot pump 30 Gbps through your WAN port because this is your limiting factor now. Now you may ask why, why is Broadcom releasing such a uh, you know, application reference diagram? 
is in this uh, limiting factor how can they promote their wi-fi 7 when this is the limiting factor anyone has a answer to this maybe for the future purpose <laughs> No, uh, so I'll tell you. So the thing is, most of the Wi-Fi traffic will not be going to the van. Remember our use cases. Wi-Fi 7 was introduced for a lot of AR, VR applications. And a lot of AR, VR or other kind of applications may be within the home. That is to say, from your laptop, you are streaming video uh, to, I don't know, your uh, smart TV. So it is device to device communication within the LAN. So that is why, you know, the Wi-Fi throughput should be high. So not, not all the traffic is going to come through the van or going to go out into the van. So there are a lot of applications which will be running within the LAN network. So that is the reason. But as the gentleman said, future, yes, in future, they may increase this also, depending on how the market is, uh, how the market progresses, what use cases get enabled. But today, this is the kind of uh, use cases we are talking about. Wi-Fi 7 will, uh, yeah, a lot of it will be land traffic, which will not be going out to the van. So when you are like going to the market and trying to assess the capability of uh, you know Wi-Fi 7 devices, these are some of the things you have to look at. What is the WAN capability? What is the total throughput on the Wi-Fi network? What is it tri-band, dual band, or quad band? What combinations are allowed? See, some uh, devices may allow only one 320 and two 160. I am giving an example. Uh, or 1320, 1160, and 1 uh, maybe 40 giga, megahertz. So that combination may be allowed. Some access points may allow uh, 2 times 320 and, and so forth. And within each link, what kind of RU allocations are permitted? That typically you may or may not get to know because you know that may be internal to the device manufacturer or the chipsets. So we may not get to know that kind of capability, but yeah, if that kind of detail is published, then you can, you will have more information to assess the capability of an access point. So these are some of the things we should look at when we are assessing the, and of course, see the main things that they will talk about is whether it's tri-band or quad-band, and uh, the total peak rate, they may say 20 Gbps, 30 Gbps. Of course, uh, you are not going to re realize 30 Gbps. It's like a theoretical rate, but it gives a kind of a ballpark sense. You know, what is the capability? And the cost, of course, will... Uh, so these capabilities will help you assess you know, whether the cost is uh, reasonable. So that's it from my side. Any uh, questions? to close.